Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our 68th session of Med AI. This week, we have Dr. Rosanna Danishio from Stanford to speak about AI in dermatology, the pitfalls and promises. Dr. Rosanna Danishio received her undergrad degree at Rice University, where she was recognized as a Goldwater Scholar. She completed her MD PhD at Stanford, where she worked in the lab of Dr. Ross Altman. During this time, she was a Howard Hughes Medical Institute medical scholar and a Paul and Daisy Soros Fellow. She completed dermatology residency at Stanford in the research track and now practices dermatology as a clinical scholar in Stanford's Department of Dermatology. She is also conducting AI research with Dr. James So as a postdoc. Her research interests are in developing diverse data sets and fair algorithms for applications in precision medicine. Thank you, Dr. Dennis Joe, for joining us today. Before we start, could you tell us your preferences about when you want to take questions? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, here today. My preference is that you uh, talk whenever you have a question so that we can try to have some kind of conversation if possible. Um, I don't know what your usual way of doing that. Do you have people raise hands? Do you interrupt? I mean, I'm fine with being interrupted, uh, but I'm just trying to figure out what the best way is for 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 to that you've facilitated questions in the past, or if you one of you guys want to pay attention to the chat and let me know if there's a question. Yeah, sounds good. So usually it's um it's a. Uh... It's for it depends on the speaker's preference. So if you would like to um have people interrupt you, then uh, we encourage that uh people to do that so that we can make this session as interactive as possible. That sounds great. So I'll just go ahead and start, and you can interrupt me. So today I'll be talking about dermatology AI. These are my conflicts of interest. They are not directly related uh to what we're going to talk about. So what, I'm a practicing dermatologist and I spend 90% of my time doing research in machine learning, artificial intelligence. And the reason I became interested in this space is there was this flurry of sort of news articles sort of claiming, you know, oh, AI is better than dermatologists at diagnosing skin cancer. Um, you know, Google making claims that their algorithm is just as accurate as a dermatologist, um, you know, very provocative things like the AI doctor will see you now. And of course, we remember that there were claims about how radiology wasn't going to exist because all the radiologists were going to get replaced by AI, which obviously has not come to fruition. And so as someone who was already a researcher, I knew that media um, portrayal of things is different than what reality is. And I really wanted to start doing research into the reality of things because I thought that, you know, there are aspects of this technology that I felt like could actually help us out a lot. Um, and I wanted to understand what some of the problems were. And of course, the American Academy of Dermatology wrote back sort of response to sort of say that they promote the idea of using these technologies to augment human abilities, um, of course. So we'll talk today about what some of the problems are that I've found and also about what some of the use cases are. And so one of the biggest things, you know, actually I was mentioning earlier that I used to do genomics research and when I was doing genomics research, one of our big concerns was bias and that all of the data, the genome data that was being generated was coming from European ancestry populations and that that data was not representative of the diversity of the earth. And so um, there are a lot of examples of this, of existing biases in medicine. And the concern is like how these biases could get encoded in technology, like technological advances. And of course, by bias, we mean differential performance on classes that are sensitive, like, such as race or gender, and that could contribute to uh, systemic disparities. 
And there's many different ways that this bias could enter into this into the space. One is biases in data sets. Another is biases in how the tasks are selected. And the other um, is, you know, a concern around biases that are amplified um, by algorithms. And one of the most striking examples of the latter biases amplified by algorithms was uh, demonstrated by Dr. Ziad Obermeyer in a paper in Science where they audited a commercially deployed algorithm it was deployed in million, uh, upon millions of patients in hospital systems, it's supposed to help physicians decide which patients might need um, additional like resources on discharge. And what they found during that audit was that that algorithm was preferentially allocating resources to white patients who were actually less sick than black patients. And the reason for that is, is because the algorithm was using healthcare expenditure spending as a proxy for how sick the patient was. But the fact of the matter is, is that because of disparities in access to care and um, you know, systemic racism, there's not equal access to care. And so spending money in the healthcare system doesn't mean you're actually sicker. And so um, that was maybe one of the most egregious cases of a bias that already existed was then amplified by an algorithm um, that we have in pu published today. There's probably many other terrible sort of examples like that outside of healthcare too. Um, and so that's why it's very important to kind of study these issues. And so uh, in terms of bias, Ade Adamson wrote this piece in JAMA Dermatology in 2018, which was about one year after the sort of seminal paper using deep learning on image recognition tasks had come out. One year after that, that seminal paper was published in Nature uh, by Esteva et al. And in this, in this, uh, in this viewpoint piece published in JAMA Dermatology, Dr. Adamson expressed concerns that, you know, these AI technologies, if we're not careful, could be designed in a biased way. And so I've done a bunch of research sort of looking, actually interrogating the potential, you know, pitfalls there. And so um, one of these studies done by a very talented, uh, this is a scoping review done by a very talented medical student at Stanford looked at research papers in the AI domain in dermatology to see if there were certain kinds of disease that algorithms are designed for. And what he found is that generally there seem to be a lot of papers around detecting skin cancers, melanomas, diseases like that, even diseases like you know psoriasis, eczema, uh, ac you know, acne gets some as well, versus like diseases that we more often see in women, such as autoimmune diseases, or in patients with skin of color, such as pig disorders of pigmentation, um, are not as often targeted at, for AI tasks. So the tasks that are getting selected have a certain bias. And so, I mean, that was sort of the example of like the bias task design. This is sort of an overview. I'm gonna talk about bias data, but to kind of give you an overview of how data is used, I think a lot of people in this, uh, in this room right now is, are familiar with this. Like when you're building a model, you know, many times you're pulling retrospective data, you have your, you know, training validation data, your, your test set data. And then uh, after you are happy with that model, you might deploy it in a clinical, a prospective clinical environment to assess impact. However, the issue is that this whole process is very much sort of, you know, dependent on data. And if you have biased data coming in, you're going to have a biased model coming out. And so um, we, decided to look at what kind of data was being used to train AI algorithms in dermatology. And so we looked at 70 papers 
in AI and dermatology to see what we could learn about the data sets that were used. And so here, um, we, I, I'm showing essentially a network of the papers in the data set. So every purple square is a paper, every circle is a data set. The red data sets are ones that are not publicly available. So there's no way for us to directly interrogate the uh, content of that data. We have to really just look at the research paper and the green aquamarine color are data sets that are publicly available and open. Um, and so what you can see here is unsurprisingly in the health with, with healthcare AI, dermatology is the example here, but I, I presume that actually many other um, specialties kind of have the same thing. It's like you have a paper paired with a single data set that's not open and no other papers are ever, you know, written versus like the publicly available data. One is the International Skin Imaging Collaboration. The publicly available data, you know, spurs a, a lot of research, which is great. Um, so because we couldn't look at a lot of the data directly, we had to look at what the papers were reporting. And what we found is that in papers who were trying to assess skin cancer, a significant percentage, much higher than I expected, actually did not use biopsy proven labels to label their skin cancers. So how did they do their labeling? They had dermatologists look at the images and say, oh, we think this is a melanoma and therefore the label for this image should be a melanoma. The problem with that is, is that a dermatologist cannot say with certainty that something is melanoma. In fact, they've looked at biopsy rates of dermatologists and found that on average, dermatologists have to biopsy seven to 10 lesions that they suspect is a melanoma before they find a real melanoma. And so using a dermatologist's judgment to label data that should really be labeled with, you know, biopsy results is uh, introducing noise. Now, pathology reads have noise as well. They're not perfect. Um, there has been data that has shown that there is both inter and even intra pathologist variability in the diagnosis of melanoma. Um, and then the other thing we found is that basically most of the papers did not describe anything about either the ethnicity or the skin tone of the patients that were in the data that was used to train the algorithm. So I'll just pause there in case there's a question. I had a question about like just the kinds of tasks that uh, like dermatology, like AI in dermatology tackles. Is it usually the like skin cancer classification or is it like risk assessment or what, what is the kind of task that you most frequently see? So skin cancer uh, classification seems to be the most popular uh, task right now, image-based. So computer vision, skin cancer detection. Um, not to say the other things that people are working on. So some people are trying to like, quantify severity of rashes because there are scales that exist that humans use to label the severity of rashes. And so people are trying to, you know, automate some of that. Um, there is some discussion around disease monitoring. There are not a lot of papers on disease monitoring. There seems to be like an emphasis on like diagnostics, uh, particularly skin cancer, but even diagnosing across other diseases, like hundreds of diseases. Got it. And typically, is this um, like I can imagine why skin tone will will obviously give, um, like for instance, the contrast is going to be very different for very yeah. different skin tones. Do you also see that it's like the ethnicity like being correlated with skin tone that's the issue, or is it in general, even if, if people have similar skin tones but you have different ethnicities, 
Is that something that also needs to be right. advice? So I don't think anyone's looked at ethnicity independent of skin tone. Um, they're not the same. And, you know, skin, certain skin tones are found across many ethnicities. People of the same ethnicity have a diversity of skin tones. So it's kind of, you know, quantifying different, you know, it's they're different. But um, we've looked at skin tone specifically, which I'll actually talk about in a minute. So right. Thank you. how do we assess the skin tones? Um, I think maybe since you that you know you're asking some great questions, but I want to let let show you guys how we assess the skin tone. So you can see that even that is not sort of the best method. So there was this scale called the Fitzpatrick skin type scale that was originally developed not for assessing skin tone, but actually assessing how easily somebody burns or tans in order to be able to uh, make an assessment about treating them with phototherapy. So light treatments, like, okay, how easily are they gonna burn with the light treatment? Um, this was then kind of co-opted into a skin tone assessment where people are looking at people's skin tone, their eye color, their hair color, to kind of categorize them into a skin type. And, um, actually originally the scale did not even include brown and black skin so that was added later and as you can see there's six categories and these categories are not fully inclusive of the full human diversity you know uh, of skin tones so it's not granular enough and there are people who are trying to develop other things such as google has been working on something called the monk scale um, named after uh, a researcher, Dr. Monk, who has been working on this. The issue is that the scales that we use clinically and why we use them clinically and the scales we want to use for machine learning to be able to decide whether or not, you know, you have bias against a certain class of skin tone, um, those kinds of scales are different, right? A human trying to make decisions about what's clinically important, can't really label something on a like, you know, 20 point scale. Like it's just, it's hard for us to do that versus a machine does not have a problem with that. So for the rest of the presentation, we use Fitzpatrick skin type for uh, many of our studies. And it's an Every paper we write, we write about the limitations of the scale, but we don't have an alternative validated scale to use. Like I said, there are people working on that. My hope is that will come to fruition. Right now, as you'll see, the bias is so bad that even on this, you know, scale that's not granular, granular enough, you know, you, you begin to see issues around, around bias. So... This was kind of all the, the stuff that I discussed before is the impetus be behind us developing what we call the diverse dermatology images data set. So it's a data set of biopsy proven clinical images across multiple diseases. And we have images from the entire Fitzpatrick uh, scale. However, one thing that we did in particular is we matched the skin type one, two, and five, six groups by age, sex, the time that the photograph was taken, like the year the photograph was taken since camera technology has changes, changes, and the disease, either diagnosis or disease kind of category, like benign or malignant, because we wanted to do head-to-head -head comparison. So we had to try to match those two groups to try to decrease the number of confounders that might come in from doing a head-to-head -head comparison. And then what we did is we took three previously developed algorithms, model derm, deep derm, ham 10,000. They had all been previously published. They've all been validated with like, you know, 0 0.9 AUC or better on their respective test sets. And then we tested it on our data. And so the thing that we found is that 
overall there was performance drops uh, for all of them compared to what they had reported in their publication. However, what was uh, significantly noticeable is that these performance, uh, this performance drop was in part driven also by a difference in performance between Fitzpatrick one and two and Fitzpatrick five and six. And so uh, people were, do the, the algorithms were doing much worse on the Fitzpatrick five and six data. And so, so sorry, Roxana, can I, can I ask one quick question? Yeah. So when you said like your data set, uh, do you accurate the data set? It's a dermoscopic images or it's uh, images from the camera or what kind of no, images? No, it's, ca it's camera images. Hmm. So model derm is, is, is trained with clinical images. Right. Derm was trained with both clinical right. and dermoscopic. CAM 10,000 was uh, with dermoscopic. Right. However, there have been studies shown that in models trained on one modality can actually do reasonably well on a, as long as like the you know if, if it's like cropped like a like right 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 like pre-processed properly yeah yeah so i don't know like how what are what are the pre-processing techniques that you guys are used particularly for this kind of like um clinical image translation you know because you said that you just use the the normal images not really like clinical images right from dermoscopic they're so clinical images are so dermoscopic images are a type of clinical images. Right. When we say clinical images, we mean images taken of a lesion in clinic. So they're okay. usually taken in a standardized way because it's for biopsy. Right. So it's not it's not like it's it's generally like pretty close like not so 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 when you said like your data set you actually have all the dermoscopic images you don't have like any images captured through the mobile camera or something like no, that no. right they are all okay mobile camera images taken in clinic okay okay so they're not okay. dermoscopic okay they're clinical okay. so so um and model derm was tra trained on similar type of clinical images Deep derm was trained on both clinical and derm. But I think that it, I think still there are a lot of like variation between the image captures that we need to normalize. Particularly so, the position wise, I don't know, like the image acquisition wise. All of dermatol. I mean, that's if you look at the training data sets, they mm -hmm. all have that heterogeneity in there. So right. it's not like, and in fact, deep derm had data from Stanford in its training. Right. So it's not a, like, even this one has like a locational, right? A locational similarity, but that's, I mean, that heterogeneity exists in all, like, that's just a fact of dermatology. There's no DICOM standards, right. there's no whatever. So when you have your, that training data has that same heterogeneity baked into it. So it's not like, it's not like the images for in model derm were like taken in a very specific way that was also mobile phone capture of images in clinic. So there's no way to get around that. Like there's no standardization in dermatology for how images. No, no, I, and that, yeah. that part is completely clear. But the one thing is that probably just to jump before jumping on the performance matrix, probably it would be nice to see the, how your model, whatever model you are trying here, how your model actually creates the difference in embeddings between the deep derm versus the right. Sanford data set, you know, just to see that embedding wise, if right. there is any big difference, like if the model can clearly understand the two defined clusters coming from two defined data set. Right. And actually we, we don't, I don't show this, but we also did use some uh, robustness methods that try to make data sets that come from different, because some of these models like deep derm, actually bring in data sets from multiple sources right. to introduce some robustness, including some Stanford data. And so we actually try to use these robustness aware methodologies that try to put their embeddings in a similar space so that you don't have as much issue with like out of distribution. So we tried all those methodologies as well. Uh, it's, it's in our supplement. But we could not we could not get the performance to improve with that. And the other thing is there's a pretty statistically significant. I mean, like 
the fact that there's a just you know general performance drop off that's not surprising that's any right. any right. but the part that's concerning is that it's very clearly a difference between uh images of different skin tones and but uh, my my main that that part is completely understandable that you right. see the difference in the skin tone right. but the the primary like worry is that you also see a huge drop in all the skin tones right well that's i mean that is a general that's more like a general problem of trying to pin down exactly what you know i guess that is we're not we're not trying to deploy any of these in clinics so it's more right. of a it's more of like an empirical assessment of a specific problem than a like figuring out why why there is a distribution drop off if that makes right. sense like that in and of itself and in fact there was a study published in Lancet Digital Health um, by some colleagues that I've worked with, I'm not on that paper, where they looked at dermoscopic images and they tried to figure out all the different, you know, human identified yeah, I know, potential yeah. Jam, James, like, James Chu's paper, right? No, this is not, uh, this is a, I, Veronica Rottenberg is one of the authors on it. So, so like, for example, like differences in lighting, differences in markings, presence of hair, you know, I, I mean, James and ever, a lot of people have looked at trying to figure out that's, that one is a dermatology specific paper, okay. but there's also like a lot of work looking at like, why, why is this data set sort of out of distribution from your training data set? which we didn't have actually have access to the training data set for all of these models. Some of them, we only had a model API. So there's like not a very, there's not an ability to, you know, assess okay. like what the training data embeddings look like versus like with our, uh, you know, our test set. But I mean, I think that is a larger general problem, but I would say that this study very much is focusing on the skin tone bias. Okay. Okay. If that makes sense. Yep, sure. So, um, sorry, I had a quick question, maybe just to, uh, in your previous slide, I saw that there is a big performance drop between the one and two and uh, five and six, even for the ensemble of dermatologists. Yes. Is yes. that basically them just looking at the image and, and seeing, or is yes. that based on the biopsy? No, they are not having any biopsy results. That is that. So, for that, we wanted to demonstrate the issue with consensus labeling. And so um, th historically there's been, so you can't make any conclusion about the clinical performance of dermatologists based on, based on uh, this study of like, just looking at an image alone. But what we wanted to show is that for example, Google's paper used consensus labeling for training their model. And they used they had images from different skin tones. Uh, they had less representation of Fitzpatrick five and six. However, um, ha however, like they so, but they had consensus labeling. And so we wanted to show that actually whether or not there was any difference in the consensus labeling performance uh, between of dermatologists, meaning it's another source of potential bias. If you're training a model that's been labeled by consensus labeling, because we found that our labelers actually did worse on Fitzpatrick five and six. And there's a lot of like history underlying that. So in dermatology textbooks, there's, uh, I have a story about that a little bit later. Like there's far less representation of diverse skin tones. Um, but of course, you know, I can't say that I, this doesn't make any claims about like clinical ability. Though there have studied many studies showing that skin cancers in patients with skin of color get diagnosed at a later time, generally speaking. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so next we want to do some experiments to see if we could close the gap in performance uh, via fine tuning the model with some diverse data. And what we found is, um, as was astutely mentioned before, there are many different things that can contribute to these distribution differences, you know, anything from lighting to 
body part that the lesion was on, many things, some things that might not even be discernible to human eye, things around camera technology. As I said, we try to match the, when the photos were taken so that the distribution of camera technology was similar across the two groups. What we found is that if we fine tune the images just on the white skin, uh, you could obviously boost the performance because then you're catching some of those uh, distribution differences that come from other things other than skin tone, because as was mentioned, like, yes, you had a pretty large overall drop in performance of all of these algorithms, but you still have quite a significant uh, gap between the uh, white skin and the uh, Fitzpatrick five and six skin. So the only way to close that gap is to actually, you know, fine tune on a diverse data set. You may think that this is a very obvious statement. Um, there are many people who, before we ran this very specific experiment, argued with us that it's possible that it wasn't, you know, the skin tone that's causing the differential performance. But, you know, with this experiment, we sort of show like, okay, you know, you fine tune just on the white skin tones that are have sort of the same disease distribution, same sex distribution, same age distribution, same time of photography distribution. Um, and you cannot fix that gap that is caused by, you know, the, the contributions of skin tone because skin disease looks different across different skin tones. Uh, may I know why, why there seems to be a slight drop in, in uh, three and four? Um, because the fine tuning here is just on one and two, and the fine tuning here is on one, two, five, and six. So three and four wasn't fine tuned on. Mm -hmm. But I also, see. I mean, if you look at these bars, that drop is probably not statistically yeah. significant of a drop. Well, thanks. Oh, I went the wrong way. Okay, so every data set has its sort of biases. This data set's biases include that it's a single center data set um, at Stanford, which is a tertiary care center. It's only biopsied lesion. So that's another thing, you know, in terms of like, okay, why did you have such a large distribution drop? These cases are likely far more challenging than the cases that the data was previously trained on because a biopsy benign lesion is probably a lesion that's more ambiguous and more difficult because it means even the dermatologist wasn't sure whether the lesion was benign or malignant because they biopsied it. So we don't have a lot of great metrics of, you know, to say one data set is harder than the other, but just by the likelihood of what kind of how this data was created, coming from lesions that were all biopsied, it's quite likely that this is a this is a more difficult data set than just your general clinic data set. Um, additionally, this had clinical images which have skin markings and rulers. I didn't discuss this, but in our paper, we did all sorts of tests to make sure, that differences in performance between the two groups of skin tones was not being confounded by the presence of uh, extraneous markings. And so the data is uh, available through the Amy Center so people can download the images. Um, they are slightly cropped differently than the data that was used in the analysis because we had to, for privacy reasons, we had to crop a little bit further. We did run you know, the algorithms again through that, we not in the publication, but just separately as a, you know, just to make sure that that seems correct. And it, it doesn't really change the performance that much with these cropped images. So we're more hoping that this can be a benchmark that people can use for testing, uh, you know, potential biases, skin tone biases in their algorithms. And so also as a result of some of this work, um, I worked with an international group of experts to basically create a checklist of considerations for early development AI and dermatology 
considerations around what data to use, consideration around, you know, how you label the data and what kind of technical assessments you do. So that's published in JAMA Dermatology if anyone's interested. And it's meant to be a resource to help people as they're th if, if they're interested in uh, dermatology AI development. So often when I talk about this, people ask about, well, what about the, F you know, what regulation is happening? What about the FDA? So F we, uh, Eric Wu and Kevin Wu and uh, James Zhu's lab, and I worked on this project as well, looked at FDA approved medical AI. There were at the time of that uh, study, 130 devices. And, you know, since then, there's probably been a lot more devices approved because at that time, 75% of the applications had been in the last two years. And um, what we found is that actually 126 out of 130 devices used only retrospective data, did not use like prospective data. And out of, 100, out of 54 high risk devices, these are devices that um, have the potential to cause patient death or significant injury all of them used retrospective data, did not have prospective trials. 93 out of 130 devices don't report how many sites they test at. And so this was a little toy example in the paper about, okay, we trained a pneumothorax uh, prediction model from a publicly, from a public chest x-ray data sets, train on one site, test across multiple sites and look at how the performance changes between sites. So not as dramatic of changes as we showed with, you know, dermatology AI. One thing that's true about radiology is that images have DICOM standards. So they're much more standardized than dermatology images. Um, and, and I hope that's the one thing you walk away with. It's just kind of knowledge that dermatology data is far more heterogeneous and far messier than some of these, uh, you know, X-ray data sets that people are working with. But also, it makes you a little bit concerned when people are using sort of single-site data to get FDA approval for deployment for their algorithms. Um, I'll just stop there in case there's any other questions. Uh this is more of a like your opinion kind of a question, but yeah, given the heterogeneity in, in like dermatology data as well as the devices which you use for dealing those images, um, what is the primary application? Is it for screening? Is it for like what? What do you? Where do you think AI can yeah. actually help? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that I see it as a as a sort of as something that could be very helpful as a sort of triage tool or a tool to like, as a support tool, rather than an autonomous system that patients use at home. Because as a support tool, you can, because it's so, I think that that, that kind of data is so sensitive to possible distribution shifts and is, more vulnerable to it. So like iPhone could come out with a new iPhone and it could be like your model starts performing a lot worse, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, is, I think that having a human in the loop is really helpful. And actually one of the algorithms that we tested, Modelderm, a newer version of that algorithm uh, did do a prospective trial. It was actually the first prospective trial published in dermatology. First randomized controlled prospective trial published in, uh, in derm. And it was very interesting because they had done all of these studies on retrospective data showing like, oh, it's like performed so well. And then when they put it into the real world, it had a significant performance drop off. And, but what they had done is they had put it in the hands of dermatology trainees and primary care trainees. And what they found is that it didn't really improve the diagnostic performance of the dermatology trainees because the dermatology trainees were already doing relatively well 
but it did actually lead to a statistically significant increase in the performance of the primary care trainees who did not have dermatology you know, training. So I think there's like a lot of opportunities to build things that can support like non-specialists with patient care. I would love for us to get to the point where actually even specialists get better performance, you know, with these models. But I think like you, you know, astutely mentioned the data heterogeneity is kind of a problem and we need to work kind of on, you know, one, like having more, you know, having more heterogeneous data sets to train on, two, like methods that help develop robust models, um, that sort of thing. And before we really get to a point where we can have really good performance uh, sort of in clinic. And I believe we can get there. I, I just think that, you know, there are low, other low hanging fruit that we can do, such as helping non-specialists get better at triaging and figuring out like, you know, which things need to be urgently said, sent to a specialist versus which things can be monitored for a little bit longer. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I have a question about um, like, I guess like um, like in terms of a prospective prospective versus retrospective trial. Um, because I guess like the model it, for training set, it's fine to be trained on tr retrospective data, but for real evaluation, maybe if, if there is a prospective data, uh, you'll be great. If not, then probably retrospective data is also fine. Well, what do you think? Or do you think that the training data also has to be uh, I, prospective? I, I think the initial, so I think the initial train test data you know, be all retrospective, mm -hmm. right? Because prospective data is expensive to collect, yeah. to do. And so I think you're, initial trained tests can be all retrospective, but then before going to deployment, then you do prospective. So first you get a model that you're like, okay, this works pretty well on retrospective data. And if you can get some external retrospective data that even makes, you know, that even makes the argument better. Cause then you, you may look for like uh, effects of distribution shifts by having an external test set. But I just think that like in order to actually evaluate it, you have to evaluate it in the same setting that the model is going to be used in. Mm -hmm. And and do you think there there's there should be a, like a one model fits all or it's it's actually okay to have like one model specific to the one institution? Yeah, I suspect just from looking at some of the literature that's been shown in radiology that um that localized fine tuning may be necessary for certain models. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that's probably going to be the case in dermatology where there is such like less standardization and like lighting conditions between clinics might be different. Um, but I think that's something that you can only kind of decide through evaluation, right? Like, mm -hmm. You take your model and say, hey, actually, hey, this model looks like it's actually pretty robust across different settings. And so then that's great. And you probably don't need to fine tune that method um, or that model. But it might turn out that other kinds of models are way more susceptible and uh, might require localized fine tuning uh, for each site. And actually we had the FDA had an expert review panel over the summer for dermatology. And that discussion was exactly had, which was like, for some of these dermatology models, like you might actually need localized fine tuning. Not only do you need localized fine tuning, over time, things may change. Like I said, yeah. if Apple comes out with a new iPhone, like you may need to, you know, fine tune your model every X amount of time. Mm -hmm. the same thing happens in radiology if they get a new radiology machine, even though they have, you know, more standardized image capture methods. So just taking a look at the time, I don't think I'm going to get through all three of these next stories. So I'll focus on the first two. And then the third one's actually a recent, uh, the explainable AI is actually a recent 
uh, Neurops Data Sense and Benchmarks paper, and I'll just sort of say, like, check it out, uh, just to be fair. So as I mentioned, there is, this was kind of discussed about the dermatologist, like, there is even a wonderful TED talk by Dr. Jenna Lester at UCSF about why skin disease is often misdiagnosed in darker skin tones. And it's part of it has to do with bias in the dermatology education. And so, for example, there was this paper that came out where they medical students went by hand and they looked at all the images in the textbooks and counted how many images were of Fitzpatrick, you know, one through four versus five, five and six. And so like they were looking at images like this and they were just hand labeling it. And I actually know the team that did it. And they told me that it took over a hundred hours to label all of this. And so the idea was like, and, and there have been many papers written along the same way, vein, like, oh, we went through all the American Academy of Dermatology's educational materials and counted by hand. And so um, in a collaboration with IBM, we said, okay, we could automate some of that. And so what we did is uh, using this sort of textbook or this PDF ingester that they had, we could ingest the textbooks, extract any images and figures. Then we had trained a model to be able to identify whether the image contained like skin in it or if it was like a histopathology slide or some other kind of figure. So we could just pull out the skin images. And then we looked at uh, segmenting out the skin from the clothing. And so this is just an example. One thing we weren't as good at doing is uh, segmenting out the disease portion of the skin. We tried, uh, but you know it wasn't perfect at that, but it did a reasonably good job of segmenting out everything else. And then you could train a ResNet model to basically re recognize if it belonged to like a light skin tone or a Fitzpatrick five and six skin tone. And then what we did is we took these textbooks that these students had spent hundreds of hours labeling and we had the ground truth of, I mean, of course there's probably some noise there, but what the students had labeled and we compared it through the performance of our kind of toolkit, which could just ingest the whole book and just like basically spit out a distribution of skin tones. Um, and so the whole idea here is that we could we are working on creating this tool to help educators in dermatology be able to actually like do an automatic assessment of their books before publication. As you can notice here, the representation is quite poor. <laughs> um, and that, again, gets to the heart of the problem when we were talking earlier about like labeling the images um, across the different skin tones. The second story is about, I think, answers the question of like, what do I see as being a useful application of these technologies to, you know, dermatology? So in COVID-19, occurred, there was a 50x increase in digital visits. So what that meant is that patients couldn't come into clinic. The video visits, the video is not a good quality. So we would ask them to take photos and send them in. However, many of their photos look like this. Like it was just not, you're not able to tell what was going on. It was too dark, it was too blurry. And so what they had us do is they actually had the residents review all of the photos the night before by you know hand and call up all the patients who were taking photos that were not good enough and something like 40 percent of images were not of sufficient quality so this was very disruptive and if a patient didn't send the photo in until last minute that was particularly disruptive so the idea was like okay can we make this so that the patients can can get some feedback on how good their image is so the whole idea is that, you know, you have a model that looks at the image, decides whether the patient needs to retake it, tells them kind of what is going on, and then is able to do that. So we took 1,700 telemedicine images, so images that were patient submitted, and then we had these clinicians 
label whether the image was good enough to use. And we also had them label why if an image was bad, like, is it too blurry? Is it too, you know, the lighting bad? Is there issues with zoom and crop? And then we trained this model that was actually a concatenation of deep learning and some classical models with handcrafted features. Like for example, we don't care if the background is blurry. So we would like segment out skin pixels and ignore, you know, the blurriness effect. It, we were really just cared about good quality of the area where the lesion was. Um, and then we were be able to have a logistic classifier that said whether the image was good or bad, but then also classifiers that could say, hey, this is blurry. Hey, this is lighting. One classifier kind of for each uh, category because you could have an image that's both dark and blurry. And what we found is that on a retrospective data set, we could find an operating point where we were able to catch about 80% of the bad quality photos and then, um, but still be able to keep around 80% of the good quality photos. Patients take maybe about 20 to 30 seconds to retake a photo. If a doctor gets a bad photo, it can take anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to like go through the process of reviewing, calling and doing it. So we, we were erring on the side of wanting to get rid of more bad photos. Um, the other thing that we did is we looked at performance of on the retrospective data across skin tone groups, across age, and across sex and found that there was not a significant you know, difference in performance across those groups. And then from there, after doing all that retrospective data work, what we did is we partnered with Gradio um, prior, to the, prior to their acquisition with Hugging Face. And we built this sort of platform to be able to have a UI that would uh, give patients feedback when they took Photo. So it's like an app and it was HIPAA compliant. So all the images were not stored on the local device. They were sent into a HIPAA compliant um, server. And we actually ran a trial so that we could give patients access to this, uh, to, to, to the model and see how they did. And so we recruited 98 patients at two sites and we asked them to take photos. And what we found is that patients who had good photos initially, A and B, in general, they weren't asked to retake photos, so there wasn't much improvement. But patients who had bad quality photos like C and D had, you know, nearly like a one-point improvement towards a B, nearly, you know, a two-point improvement towards a B. So, like, their images actually improved, um, improved through the use of the app in a statistically significant way. And so these kinds of improvements um, kind of lead from images being completely unusable to images that are much more usable. These are patient captured images. And so that makes life a lot easier for clinicians. And so uh, as a next step, we've actually, uh, we've been fun, we have funding from Stanford Catalyst. And uh, you saw that the UI that we made for our trial was not the most beautiful looking thing was just trying to you know, see if the model worked in the real world in the perspective setting. Um, but after we showed you know, positive results, we have teamed up with the UI team that's creating sort of more beautiful looking UI for um, additional like testing and implementation on a much larger scale within the healthcare system. So, that is the end of uh, that story, if people have any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis Joe, for a very fruitful discussion in um, AI in dermatology. Before we open the floor for questions, let's all give Dr. Dennis Joe a round of virtual applause. Thank you so much for the presentation. Is there yeah. any questions from the audience? I will say one last thing. So my my final plug, the story I didn't get to, this is a this is is another data set which we densely annotated for fine grained model debugging and analysis. And I just want you guys to know about it in case you're doing any kind of interpretability or explainable method development. 
we've created this data set to help you to be able to test your methods. So I'm sorry I didn't get to get to it, but I just wanted you to know about it. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions from the audience? Um, I can get started with one. So um, I found the idea of true image to be actually really cool. Like it, it, it sort of uses the, the AI that we are building, but to actually, you know, help like both humans and uh, save hours, which is, which is very important. Um, I was curious to know like how you assess the quality, like, is it, is, is it the case that you're actually sending the image to a model and then you're receiving the output in real time? And, and yes. Like, oh, okay. That's what we built to test it in clinic. The patients were getting real time feedback. They had a phone with the app running mm. and, and, and also they could delete their image before they ran the model. That was the most interesting part to me is that it would look at it and be like, no, that looks like a good image. And then they would <laughs> press like submit and get the feedback. And so it was just interesting. Like they had the option to delete and retake before they asked the models to run on it. And they would look at it and be like, no, no, this is what I like <laughs> to really simulate, like, you know, a chance to say, no, I shouldn't send this in because it's not mm -hmm. a good photo. Um, and then the, some of them had a good photo on the first try. And so for those one, both the before and the after for the statistical analysis, it's like, it's good before and it's good after, mm -hmm. right? But, um, but, but yeah, no, 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 it was real. It, I think, I, do, I don't know, at least in the dermatology department, the first real time, you know, assessment trial where it's like, because that's the only way to test it because the patients had to react in real time to the feedback that they were given. And then on the back end, what we did is we collected all those photos, the befores, the afters, and we gave it to some clinicians who were not involved in the, you know, in, 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 in that uh, knowing what the images outputs were. We didn't tell them anything, they didn't know, and the images were all scrambled and they just had to grade the images of whether or not they were usable. Um, and so that was how we were able to say like, look, we knew like what the before and after was like, okay, the after photos like got much higher, better scores than the before photos. Um, by an independent group of clinicians who were like grading the usability of the photos. Oh, that's awesome. Great to hear. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? I actually have one more question, but um, yeah, so of course. I think in the middle of the talk, there was this interesting point that C raised, um, which is, um, is like, do we need a model that fits like all institutions or do we yes. like, have, like, bet is it better to fine tune for each institution? I wanted to get your take on, is do we need a model that fits all skin tones or do we, can we have like separate? I mean, clearly there is a big difference between like, like groups five and six and, one and two, is it better to fine tune them separately and, and get them to perform better? Or do, yeah. what is your take on that? Um, so I think that it is not so binary, skin tone is not so, like it's such a spectrum that I think actually you can, I think you can train a model that covers all skin tones. And I think that some of our fine tuning experiments on diverse skin tones has shown that you can train a model across all skin tones. And I think the example I always give on like, is like, okay, think about ImageNet. Like you don't train a separate model to be able to find like a black cat versus like a yellow cat versus a white cat, right? Like you train a model that identifies cats and mm -hmm. you can do that. Um, I think sometimes, so I think, I think it's quite possible to do it across. And I think we've shown that. You just have to have enough data because there are still features that are, shared by the diagnoses across all skin tones. And it's mm. just, if it sees enough example across skin tones, then it's going to upweight those features more that, so than like the features that might be just unique to particular, you know, the particular skin tones. Um, so I think that that is quite possible. 
And then I saw a question in the chat by Ramon. And actually, yes, we did do quality measurement. Uh, for I'm assuming this has to do with the study where we looked at skin tones differences. And we did look at we did look at quality score, and there was no difference between quality score. Uh, we had the, that independently rated as well for each image. So we tried to control for every possible confounder other than skin tone for that like study. Did we, I mean, I think we did it as reasonable of a job as we could to control for other things that could be causing differential performance. Okay, well, um, I just want to thank everybody because I think this is a very engaged group and I, as a speaker, very much appreciate having an engaged group. I really enjoyed all of your questions. I really enjoyed like thinking deeper and probing. So thank you. It's much better than like talking to a screen and nobody asks any questions. I appreciate it deeply, um, all of the questions that you asked. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Denjo, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we will see you next week at uh, some time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, actually, I forgot to ask. Uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs>